special presentation of LOBN with archaeologists Dr. Lawrence Garrity and Dr. Doug Clark, Excavating the Bible. Welcome to this edition of Excavating the Bible, what archaeology can teach us. This program is dedicated to exploring the contributions of Middle Eastern archaeology to our understanding of the Bible and to our appreciation for it. I'm Doug Clark, director of the Center for Near Eastern Archaeology at La Sierra University in Riverside, California, and I'm joined with fellow La Sierraites, uh, Dr. Larry Garrity, um, an archaeology degree from Harvard University, and working before I came, but I think we have about 40-some years right. working together in the Middle East, mm -hmm. and to join us for this conversation uh, as several, and several more as we're talking about archaeology in the Bible, Dr. Kent Bramlett, uh, Associate Professor of Archaeology and the History of Antiquity, also at La Sierra University, with, what, 20, now 21 years. Uh, uh, that's uh, what it is, yeah. Uh, of experience working in archaeology. Is that called a half-life of ours? <laughs> <laughs> I think that sounds I, I old. I hope your life is long then. <laughs> <laughs> we have been privileged to, to talk for um, several programs so far on archaeology of the Bible book mm -hmm. by book. Mm -hmm. And we've spent several episodes on Genesis and on Exodus. And now we're turning to the scintillating book of mm -hmm. Leviticus. And we actually have four sessions planned uh, for Leviticus. So, an initial question. When somebody says the biblical book, the name of the biblical book, Leviticus, does that cause your eyes to glaze over? Does that say to you, now is an opportunity to read my favorite devotional book? Uh, how, do, how does the book Leviticus come across to you? I don't go to it for devotional usually, <laughs> but it is of interest, I think, to all three of us because we care a great deal about the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament. But I think the average person, when they're reading through the Bible, is tempted to uh, skip Leviticus <laughs> and maybe come back to it later. <laughs> if, if later, if ever, later comes. ever comes. If later ever comes, right. <laughs> yes, it, it doesn't have a narrative immediacy to it. No, no. But um, there are fascinating insights, I think, that we can extract from Leviticus. Mm -hmm. And maybe insights that illustrate the biblical world better mm, than yes. some of the other narratives mm, yeah, because true. the whole notion that we'll be talking about for this particular episode of, of holiness um, and this notion of being set apart um, and the holy and the profane, I mean that's a part of their world mm. that they lived all the time. We have mm -hmm. to we have to mm -hmm. dig around, excuse mm -hmm. me for uh, <laughs> using an archaeological term, but we have to dig around to find out why and mm -hmm. to somehow understand their world. Mm -hmm. Leviticus is in some ways uh, an, a, a microscope into that world. Mm -hmm. I do have a former student, uh, also teaches at uh, La Sierra in chemistry, who thinks that Leviticus is her favorite book. Really? Now that's exciting mm -hmm. and that's interesting and I salute her. I think mm -hmm. this is a, a great idea. And I thought too that again because of what it tells us about the world of the Bible, mm -hmm. it really can be helpful. Mm -hmm. Before we actually turn to Leviticus, we have some artifacts in front of us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so let's just take a minute and talk about them briefly. Um, Larry, some uh, ceramic artifacts and a metal one, a metal one over there. Right. These, uh, these uh, ceramics come uh, mostly from what we call the Iron Age, which would be the uh, time of the monarchy mm -hmm. uh, and subsequent years in Israel. And we've got a chalice here and a, a goblet. Just notice how they're both uh, footed. And then we've got an incense burner here. And an incense, um, what do we a call it? A shovel. A shovel, right. So when the priest is uh, wanting to clean up in the holy or the most holy, wherever the incense is being burned, he can use that to uh, shovel out the remains mm -hmm. and uh, dispose of it. And there's something interesting about that artifact. Mm -hmm. The incense shov uh, shovels, Ya'im in Hebrew, it's one of the few artifacts that we think we can really know what they were called in ancient times. Uh -huh. Most of the time we're guessing, you know, what, yeah. what did yeah. the ancients call But the actual Hebrew term is in the Bible. It is, yeah. yeah. And then a miniature, a very miniature, kind of the top of what famous law code? Yes, Hammurabi's law. Right. 
And we'll actually be looking at some text from Hammurabi, the Hammurabi Law Code mm -hmm. this evening. This would be, what, 18th uh, century um, B.C., something right. like that? Something yeah. uh, maybe 19th, uh, but uh, in any case, mm -hmm. around for a while, mm -hmm. yes. So. Now, there is a, a plate full of bones, Kent. Um, these come from a particular location at our site at Amari, but they're here to illustrate something about worship. Um, so what do right. we have? Well, we have um, sheep bones and goat bones, and one bone here that's actually pig, pig bone. Those are rare, aren't they, well, depending on what, right. where, and, where they come from. Exactly, mm -hmm. common in Philistine contexts, mm -hmm much rarer, but not absent mm -hmm. in early Israelite uh, contexts, mm -hmm. and Canaanite contexts in general. Mm -hmm. um, but we often find bones like this from uh, cultic contexts. Mm -hmm. People would bring their offerings to the priests. Um, they would sometimes have a communal meal together, and we find the bones then left as mm -hmm. refuse. Mm -hmm. All right. So an early potluck. Uh, yeah, it was. Actually mm -hmm. going way back. I mean, mm -hmm. I think probably from the earliest times we have altars mm -hmm. and worship sites, worship locations, mm -hmm. we've got something suggesting food. Mm -hmm. We do. Food eaten there. And then Kent, we have some figurines. These are um, animal figurines, well, with a human mm -hmm. on one of them. Talk to us about these for just a second. Well, the, we find different animals represented, obviously a bovine form. Some were left guessing about mm -hmm. exactly which <laughs> animals they were. Um, some of these contained uh, liquids. They have um, spouts on them. You could pour libations mm -hmm. out through the animal form. Um, we think they represented aspects of the deities. Um, sometimes the animal would be what we call the companion figure of a deity. It was known to represent uh, characteristics of, of deities. And the, um, gold, the golden calf, many people think, was mm -hmm. this kind of a thing. Right. And as the place where Yahweh could mm -hmm. ride on the, the companion calf. Animal companion animal. Companion animal, right. Of, of L or mm -hmm. sometimes Bell. Right, mm -hmm. right. And we may see some companions over on this end of the table, at least one small <laughs> companion. Mm -hmm. uh, but here, some lamps. Um, most of these are in, in what we call the Iron Age, so the time of the kings, the time mm. of the monarchy. Contemporary monarch. with these That's uh, vessels over here. Um, this one is a 13 spouted uh, lamp mm -hmm. with um, well, actually coming from the Byzantine period, so it's Christian, mm -hmm. probably 6th century AD. Um, 13, I'm not sure why. You um, think 12 perhaps. Well, at least the way we think mm -hmm. uh, 12 would be better than 13, but in any case, uh, that is what they've chosen. And then some figurines over here, some humans. So we have animal figurines mm -hmm. and human figurines. These are all female. One is double-headed. Mm -hmm. um, and they are, especially the ones on my left, are the, the pillar figurines. Mm -hmm. uh, again, from the time of the monarchy. Very and common. common aren't they? Extremely yeah, that's common. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and I think we'll have to talk about those. I mean, Leviticus mm -hmm. uh, is concerned about appropriate worship. Mm -hmm. And of course, the prophets come unglued when worship isn't appropriate. <laughs> so I think we have to talk about those mm -hmm. and what role they played. And if, if in fact, they were deities and should be thrown out, or if, in fact, they were kind of good luck charms mm -hmm. or at least some kind of assistance in a world characterized by holiness. Mm -hmm. See, we, we still have to think about that. The world of Leviticus is not our world. No. It's not the world uh, in which we live, at least in the Western mm -hmm. uh, hemisphere. And then there is one of those very small um, figurines that would have mounted, it actually has a little peg on the bottom, mm -hmm. that would have mounted on the something of an animal probably. And then um, a modern rendition of an Anubis statue will actually be coming back in a future program on Leviticus to thinking about the deities, mm -hmm. the, the gods and goddesses around. So lots of artifacts, lots of fun things to think about. Uh, let's turn our attention then to the book of Leviticus. And we do so with some help from the slides. Um, there are different ways to outline a, a biblical book. I think if you look at pretty much any commentary, they're going to have their own spin on, mm -hmm. on outlining the book. Mm -hmm. But I think this one is helpful. Uh, we have some guidelines for worshipers um, in the first seven chapters. And then you have personnel, so Aaron and priests. Um, in uh, chapters 8 through 10, um, you have actually some danger associated with Aaron, certainly with his sons, mm -hmm. that comes up in this, ch in this uh, uh, book as well. And then uncleanness. Holiness and uncleanness 
while they seem to be opposites of each other, actually carry some of the very same characteristics. Mm -hmm. And so we'll have to think about it. This is not our world. No. This is a totally different world. And obviously that's why it makes it difficult for modern readers often to appreciate right. Leviticus because it's so totally foreign to what we experience today. Right. Which in some ways makes it fun. Yeah. Uh, to talk about right. because it's it's plowing new territory right. Uh, right. Mm -hmm. I mean, in some ways for ourselves but mm -hmm. certainly for mm -hmm. many uh, fairly casual readers mm -hmm. of uh, the Bible and then the Day of Atonement Yom Kippur one chapter and then what is known as the Holiness Code mm -hmm. chapters 17 through 26 um, given that label because of the focus on holiness defined in a couple of ways. Uh, one, this kind of separateness, but one, morality, mm -hmm. one, righteousness. Mm -hmm. So we have both of those. We'll get to that uh, momentarily. And then some regulations regarding vows. Mm -hmm. One of the questions that, or, or one of the issues that I think we're all interested in when it comes to a book like Leviticus, mm -hmm. how people approach it. Mm -hmm. And what are maybe the more responsible ways to read Leviticus, to mm -hmm. somehow to put ourselves into the sandals of the ancient people. Mm -hmm. And their world would have been surrounded by this, mm -hmm. uh, by Leviticus. Mm -hmm. Ours isn't. And so how do we get into it? And so how do we study it? Um, pick one of these, Larry and Kent, and, and talk about it for just a minute. Well. You know, anthropological and, and archaeological is our specialty, although we deal with the others too. But the important thing to realize is that Leviticus was not understood in its context for most of past history. But it's these modern approaches that are available to us now that didn't used to be as a result of excavation and study over there that we can set the book of Leviticus in its historical and literary context um, in its ritual context, if you want to say mm -hmm. that. And so we, we can understand it so much better. And I think then people who begin to see it through some of these methods of approach can get excited about it mm -hmm. and understand it for the, maybe the first time. Mm -hmm. So the process of interpretation is actually becoming better, it maybe is better. easier yes. in some right. ways. Right. I mean, it, it is research, and we, one has right. to think about these things. Right. But at the same time, the discoveries have opened windows mm -hmm. onto this book mm -hmm. that we just didn't have before. I right. think that's what I heard right. you say. Right, mm -hmm. right. Kent, mm -hmm. what about some of these? Other well, I was going to mention the ritual, but it also ties into the anthropology yeah, that you mentioned. <laughs> Even comparative studies with other cultures which still have a sense of clean and unclean, because mm -hmm. we generally don't. Right. But um, the Roma people or Gypsy mm -hmm. people have a very strong sense of, of clean and unclean. And it can help us, I think, understand the world of the Bible mm -hmm by looking at other cultures. Mm -hmm. Well, and I'm thinking that um, the health and well-being approach, mm -hmm. I mean, one reads those guidelines for what to eat and what not to eat, and mm -hmm. it, it looks pretty much like here you have a table and you choose this and you don't choose that. Mm -hmm. uh, and we typically think about it from our point of view, from the perspective of health mm -hmm. and well-being. Um, probably, I think according to most people who study these things these days, the emphasis on those lists is more ritual, like mm -hmm. you talked about, more ceremonial, mm -hmm. more t uh, this world of holiness mm -hmm. of which we are not a part, but mm -hmm. we now have an opportunity mm -hmm. to be a part. Mm -hmm. so. Uh, literary, um, maybe I should say something about that too. Uh, literary in a couple of ways. One, um, looking at the text of a book like Leviticus and saying, okay, so why do we have these laws? Why do we have what looks like repetition? Why do we have laws that seem to work better in the settled land than mm -hmm. in the desert context mm -hmm. where this is given? Um, and so people have asked the question, are there pieces to these books mm -hmm. that we that might be able to understand them better mm -hmm. if we see that they actually, some parts at least, were given in the, in the land mm -hmm. where they would make some sense. Mm -hmm. So th th that's one angle. Mm -hmm. Another one is, um, is it narrative? Is it poetry? Well, it's not really poetry. Mm -hmm. Is it a narrative? It certainly doesn't develop any suspense mm -hmm. or anything like that. Um, so we have to ask the question, what kind of book is this? What's its genre? Mm -hmm. um, and it certainly has a lot in common with law codes. I mean, mm -hmm. yeah. if a person does this, mm -hmm. this is what happens. Mm -hmm. And so um, these listings, and we have lots of examples in the ancient world of these mm -hmm. lists of laws. Mm -hmm. So 
literary. Um, and again, we didn't know those lists before modern archaeology came along, right. you know, and discovered Hammurabi or, or Namu and these right. various kings who promulgated uh, law codes. Right. And so we see that this is just another one of many that existed in, what shall we say, the second half of the of the the second millennium, right. you know, and it, there's a home for these kinds of things there. Right, right, yeah. right. And then <clears throat> devotional, I don't know if I could find too many people, you alluded to this earlier, Larry, <laughs> if I were to go into where people do their devotional mm -hmm, reading mm -hmm, from the Bible, mm -hmm. I doubt I would find too many open to the book of Leviticus. Right. Um, what, I mean, if there, there were. Texts there. there yes. There's a, a passage or two that people could read right. and ponder and gain something from in a devotional way, but the, as, a, as a whole, that, that's not a devotional. Maybe book. it once through as you're reading the Bible. Right. right. I mean, <laughs> beginning to end, but right. uh, yeah, right, people right. don't generally turn right. there. Now, you do have, in the Holiness Code, the second great commandment, to yes. love your neighbor as yourself. Mm. So, I mean, there are some familiar oh, yes. um, verses, right. but not a lot, and they're, they're not the kind of cozy, get a, a good, positive, warm feeling for the day mm -hmm. uh, when you have the death of Aaron's sons mm -hmm. for making the wrong kind of fire, putting the wrong kind of fire mm -hmm. into their worship mm -hmm. uh, practices. So, and, and the sentence of death mm -hmm. for so many infractions. Right. Uh, so being devotional is, is a bit of a challenge mm -hmm. for this book. But that shows us that the Bible is full of different kinds of yes. literature. Good we, point. we don't expect everything to be devotional. Good some point. of it is definitely historical. Some of it is story. Right, right, or right, right. Poetry, as you said, and many other kinds of literature. Now, the word holy or holiness, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. how should we define it? If you look it up in a dictionary, just in common usage, There'll be a range that would include what kinds of things? What would you think, what would come to your mind as you see the word holy or holiness, just kind of from a modern point of view? Probably something set apart or dedicated to religion or deity. Okay, so something, s separation would be Separation. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What else would come to your minds? It definitely has a religious right. context, right. doesn't it? So yeah. tied somehow to deity, tied mm -hmm. somehow mm -hmm. to God, or if you're reading about it in other places in the ancient world, then the gods. Mm -hmm. a, a secondary thought comes to mind that one treats holy things differently. Um, you know, traditions about how to treat the Bible mm -hmm. or how to walk in the sanctuary, mm -hmm. again, reflect that tendency. Right, mm -hmm. right, right. Mm -hmm. The notion of separation, I think, Biblical scholars would say that's probably one of the strongest components, at least one of the strongest mm -hmm. emphases of the word holiness. Mm -hmm. Because it's holy, of course, dedicated to deity. Mm -hmm. It's holy as opposed to something that isn't. Mm -hmm. um, and therefore, it's important in ways. Mm -hmm. And it's, I, I don't know if people are going to like this, but it's, it's potentially dangerous. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you touch the ark, the holy ark, like as it did. did. Mm -hmm. And that's dangerous. That's deadly. Mm -hmm. So there's something potent about it. Again, it's not our world, mm -hmm. uh, but it certainly is the mm -hmm. world of the book of, of mm -hmm. uh, Leviticus. So we have that. Now, the, the words on the um, slide here come from Rudolf Otto in his mm -hmm. famous work, The Idea of the Holy. A terrific, a terrific book. And he uses the language of mysterium tremendum, mm -hmm. by which he means that holiness is truly mysterious, which means that there are parts of holiness we simply never will get to. Mm -hmm. We keep trying, but we'll never get to because it's beyond us. Mm -hmm. And as God is beyond us, mm -hmm. um, there's something behind. Mm -hmm. And it's tremendous because it is such a powerful force. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so holiness, um, thinking about that as this tremendous mystery. Mm -hmm. And then the other terms that he uses, a numinous unease, the deity, the Newman, mm -hmm. um, and unease because even though we would love and worship and treasure God, God is still God. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I don't have a deep enough voice to say God is <laughs> God. You know, I mean, mm -hmm. all capital letters in mm -hmm. bold type, mm -hmm. and that should say something about 
the difference that you just talked about, that mm -hmm. there's something special, mm -hmm. and it is holy, and one has to be careful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. As much as we worship God, mm -hmm. one has to be careful to think about mm -hmm. that. You know, in Judaism, up front on the platform, there's an ark or a case, right? right? And there's special rituals in opening that up and taking out the Torah, right. which in Judaism is, is the holiest thing. And I remember growing up as a kid, children weren't supposed to run around on the platform or the rostrum because this is sort of holy for, right. for adults, for ministers, and right. so on. So each, each of us has our own way of, uh, of expressing right. the numinous. <laughs> That's right. Um, and, and it is something that while we are comfortable with God, and for Christians, of course, the picture of God through which we filter pretty much everything else in the Bible is Jesus. Right. Mm -hmm. And so it's the gentle mm -hmm. Jesus, the mm -hmm. caring Jesus, mm -hmm. the Jesus who is with children, loves mm -hmm. children. Mm -hmm. um, the God of the Old Testament, um, yes, there are children tied, but more it's, um, there's... There's a distance. Mm -hmm. There is not trifle yeah. with the holy. No, you right, don't right. trifle mm -hmm. with the holy. That's right. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a good way to help us think about mm -hmm. this. Mm -hmm. um, others have used the word wholeness, which is kind of a positive thing. Right. Holiness as being complete and mm -hmm. whole. Mm -hmm. And I think that um, the anthropologists, especially somebody like um, uh, Mary Douglas, mm -hmm. and we'll come to her in a minute, um, would say that when wholeness is broken, then one gets into the world of the unclean. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that's going to be important mm -hmm. uh, here in a bit. Mm -hmm. So there's the clean and unclean and the holiness code, which we've talked about, mm -hmm. Leviticus uh, uh, 17 to 26. Clean and unclean. Ah, Mary Douglas' name. Mm -hmm. um, I have found Mary Douglas to be, in, you know, just tremendously insightful mm -hmm. um, and helpful. She's an anthropologist. She right? is an anthropologist mm -hmm. from mm -hmm. Britain extremely important in, uh, in ritual studies, mm -hmm. uh, certainly in scholarship. Mm -hmm. And her notion of cleanness uh, and unclean, and then the parallels between unclean and holiness, which again, we don't, we're just not, we just don't think of those mm -hmm. in the same breath, um, are interesting. Where she talks about the ritual component and that uncleanness, especially unclean, Uncleanness is powerful. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's dangerous, mm -hmm. and you have to be careful. Mm -hmm. um, don't touch that. Um, and there's so many guidelines in the Pentateuch, in these first five books, mm -hmm. about the danger of doing something because uh, it is holy. So we have all these laws pertaining to women when they're having their period, right? right that there's right. something right. something special there is. about that. That's that, right. Uh, you know. In fact, any bodily emission yeah. mm -hmm. renders mm -hmm. a person ritually unclean. Ritually because you wait until the evening mm -hmm. to remedy that. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. If it were just physical, why wouldn't you just take care of it? So mm -hmm. there's, again, there's something tied here that's uh, mm -hmm. part of their world. And so ours. finding ways to cleanse yourself is really important. And so water is certainly one of the ways, but the sure. other way. Sure. And so Muslims today, uh, you know, put water on yeah. all their orifices before right. they worship right. as a way of cleansing themselves and getting ready for yeah. prayer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and, if, and if the feelings there are similar to the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, then whether it's spittle, sweat, mm -hmm. the priests had to wear lightweight linen mm -hmm. garments mm -hmm. uh, so that they didn't sweat and become unfit mm -hmm. to serve. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, these are these, like, they're just interesting <laughs> things, right, I think. Right. Mm -hmm. And then the notion that Something that is un, that, that uncleanness itself is somehow material and is somehow contagious. Mm -hmm. You can catch uncleanness by touching mm -hmm. the wrong stuff mm -hmm. or the wrong people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And again, this is ritual. Mm -hmm. This is uh, not that physical or cleanliness, uh, kind of the mm -hmm. um, what um, sanitation sort of mm -hmm. perspective mm -hmm. that we have. Mm -hmm. I, I wouldn't dissociate that entirely. No. But the primary focus mm -hmm. is on this ritual, mm -hmm. which then opens up the book of Leviticus mm -hmm. in new ways. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, we have some law codes that actually have some parallels. So. Mm -hmm. Um, you can biblical see here, parallels. Yes, biblical mm -hmm. parallels. Um, and you can see that the, uh, the Code of uh, Ornamu, and the next slide I think will tell us that mm -hmm. it's, uh, I think it's the 21st century mm -hmm. BC, 
Um, so the, the holiness code has parallels. Uh, but let's look at an example. Kent, maybe uh, read here for us. If one citizen rapes the slave of another who is marriageable, then the fine is one and two-thirds ounces of silver, Article 8. Okay, Larry, what does the biblical text have to say? If a man lies carnally with a woman who is a slave, betrothed to another man and not yet ransomed or given her freedom, they shall not be put to death because she was not free, but he shall bring a guilt offering, a ram, according to Leviticus 19. So, uh, again, part of the holiness code. So, comparisons here, um, one, the level of stringency doesn't seem to be too much different, um, but there would be a death penalty if circumstances had changed with the woman's status, not his status, mm -hmm. but the woman's status. Mm -hmm. So... And Urnamu is 4,000 years ago, isn't it? It's as far from Christ's time as we are. Yeah. Only In the, the opposite way. direction. Right. Exactly. <laughs> um, okay. The Code of Hammurabi. We had the little replica here, the miniature. Right. Mm -hmm. um, Larry, what does the code have to say about uh, bribes? If a judge accepts a bribe to render and seal a decision, then the judge is fined 12 times the settlement and expelled from the bench. And Leviticus 19, Kent. You shall do no injustice in judgment. You shall not be partial to the poor or defer to the great, but in righteousness shall you judge your neighbor. Levit Leviticus 19, verse 15. So no penalty assigned in Leviticus, whereas we do have one here. Um, being expelled. So bribery uh, is leading to the uh, um, ex expulsion from the, uh, mm -hmm. from mm -hmm. the bench. Um, Kent, uh, the article from the code. If a citizen had sexual intercourse with his daughter, then he is exiled from the city. Article 154. Okay. Larry? None of you shall approach anyone near of kin to him to uncover nakedness. I am the Lord. So we have these, in fact, we have lots of sexual guidelines. Mm -hmm. um, we'll not have time to look at some of these others, mm -hmm. perhaps in the future. Um, but there are several of these parallels. Mm -hmm. Many of them have to do with sexuality. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think when we excavate and we see these houses so close together, mm -hmm. there might be reason for yeah, all right. of these. Right. Uh, but they have to do with holiness. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, so some parallels, some comparisons, um, a book that is very important in this context. Old Testament parallels, a very important one. Mm -hmm. I want to thank you, Larry and Kent, uh, and all of you for joining us for this edition of Excavating the Bible. We hope the program has given you something to think about and something to encourage your faith. And we look forward to next time. Until then, think ancient, keep believing, and keep exploring. For Excavating the Bible, I'm Doug Clark.